I dream for all of us to own wardrobes with garments made from sustainable sources, including fair wages for the makers. I aim to motivate and inspire viewers to see the clothes they wear as an expression of their personality and their beliefs. This is the Slow Wardrobe. Come and have a look. Hello, welcome to episode two of the Slow Wardrobe podcast. I am Linda, your host. I am owner, or as I prefer to call it, curator at the Slow Wardrobe, where we design and make a collection of garments called Layer Cake, all based on clothes that I like to wear. We try to break the mold with how clothes are worn, what clothes are for, and uh, how we combine them. Uh, lots of layering, hence the name. Um, I also have my own uh, ranges of yarn, two different yarns uh, called Soliloquy and Trinity Twist. We will touch on those in different episodes. There's one actually shown here in uh, a new pattern that we talk about this episode called the uh, Trinity Shrug. It can be worn in lots of different ways, which I'll show you about. And it's currently available as a kit. Um, I'm also in this episode uh, showing my Victorian sock knitting machine in action. I'm doing a demonstration of double knitting uh, as featured in the Gingham Wingham scarf pattern, which is uh, one of my most popular patterns. And I show a fix that I applied to the second Gramps Revive cardigan that I knitted. I was already knitting it when the previous episode aired and I showed you my first version of that cardigan. I did another one since and uh, completely unexpectedly that cardigan ended up with a bit of an issue. Um, it ended up being too wide around the neckline and there is a very easy fix that you can apply to garments that that happens with that you will be able to use yourself. I demonstrate what that fix is like and then you can see where and how you can use it in garments that you already own. And last but not least, um, I will show a bunch of examples, styling examples and ideas again for how to wear layer cake uh, this autumn and into winter, both the linen and the wool options. The interview that we did in episode one with uh, Felicity Ford, uh, aka Felix or Net Netsonic, was uh, received very well. Thank you very much for the feedback that I received both on and offline about that. Next episode, there will be an interview again. Maybe I'll try and alternate episodes with and without interviews. We'll see how we go. Let me know what you think about this episode, both in terms of content and length and uh, how you find it compares to the interviews, whether you like alternating like that. Any feedback is very, very welcome. So without further ado, let's jump in. Okay, so what I want to show you here are the different ways in which the uh, Trinity Shrug can be worn. This is the first one that I showed at the introduction. It is basically using the big panel that it consists of. As you can see, it is a panel that is knitted as a diamond with two long flaps attached to it. With armholes and the pattern gives you instructions as to how to determine the size of the panel and the uh, armholes to make sure that it fits you. The first way to wear it is to put the panel in the front as the front of the shrug and wear it as a garment effectively. In the back you then cross over those two long flaps like this and work them back to the front. The idea is that you tie them under the bust or at waist level, whichever you are more comfortable with. And you can then choose as to how you either 
do or don't flatten these panels that come to the front to uh, close the gaps or whether you just do them like that and, and show the gap underneath the arm. The other thing you can, other way you can do, of course, is to tie this over the top. The difference being that you then get even more of an accentuated, accentuated waistline and um, it tucks that front bit in. If you don't have a tummy issue here, then this of course works a treat. If you prefer to hide your tummy, then just put them underneath, the ties underneath, and let this hang over the top. Like that. So that's way to wear number one. And in the back, you get a nice crossover of panels. Of course, you can put this crossover of panels in the front turning the whole thing around and making more of a feature of your boobs, should you like that. So, panel in the back, crossover in the front, and tight if you want to emphasize your boobs or loose if you don't want to. You can then either tie it in the back or come back to the front and tie them here. And depending on how boobalicious you are, you then make sure that this sits nicely in this area. In the back, the back panel can just hang loose, like I've done it here. Or again, you can tie this tie this tighter with the uh, fabric over the top, so you cinch it in just like I did the other way around. So that's another way to wear. A third way to wear would be to just wear it like a tiny little cardigan, a loose little shrug, tying it here, letting this hang freely, and creating a cinched effect by letting this just hang out rather than bringing everything in. So um, especially in the case of a bigger bust, you may be more comfortable letting it just sit rather than cinching it all in. And then oh, I'll bring this back a little bit so you can see there. You can see how um, what a nice long elongated line this tied front creates and um, in the mirror you can see what happening what's happening in the side as well over here then last but not least you can wear the whole thing as a shawl or as a scarf either by putting the big triangular panel in the back and then just winding this around lots of times and tying it. It's more like a cowl like this. With the advantage that the little panel on the back will keep the top of your neck and shoulders nice and warm, which is always good, especially when you have short hair like mine. I always get a cold neck, when, I, especially right after I've had a haircut. And uh, you can, of course, also go the other way around. putting that triangular panel at the front and creating a nice color effect there. And then again, go around more or less and tie to create the shawl like that. Lots of different options to play with and lots of different possibilities with the Trinity Shrug. At the moment, I'm only selling uh, the Trinity Shrug as a kit with the yarn, with the Trinity yarn. In the new year, I will, uh, I'm planning to make the uh, new pattern available separately as well. At the moment, it's just available as a Shrug kit. If you are not particularly interested in seeing the sock knitting machine in action, 
Then fast forward to 21 and a half minutes into the video for the next segment. What you see me do here is to prepare the sock knitting machine um, by putting waste yarn on it. The bit that I was moving just there in the middle, that looks a little bit like a, a, a sun shape, is a, a claw with lots of little hooks on it that is just hanging in the middle there and lined up with the needles that go around the outside of the circle that you see. And the needles are the ones that end up making the stitches. What I'm starting to do is to take the waste yarn and catch every other needle. Right now I'm catching a needle. Then I go in with the yarn and catch one of the hooks of the claw. Then I skip a needle, get the next one and get the next hook of the claw. So I catch every other knitting needle of the grid around the outside. I'm speeding it up here because it gets incredibly boring otherwise to watch at normal speed. So I go one time around like that with the waste yarn catching every other needle. The claw and the hooks that are on the inside help keep the thread under tension once we start knitting. So right now it is not under tension obviously, but once I start knitting I actually pull that claw there to keep the yarn taut. That's me there pulling the uh, end, just the end of the yarn through, through the claw, so that, that's just to keep it out of the way. And now I'm feeding the other end of the yarn through the uh, feeder that's going to run around the outside while we're knitting. You'll see it in action in a second. Now we're going to get going and you'll see that that little half moon shape feeds the yarn through as it moves around and is being literally being pulled around the outside of the knitting needles in a circular motion and the knitting needles go up and down in, um, in, in sequence with the uh, moon shape going around and uh, make stitches as they go along. You'll see the needles rise and fall. Every time a needle goes down it makes a stitch and every time the needle comes up it grabs the new feed of yarn. What you're seeing me doing at the moment is to use a tiny little hook to pull the last stitch or the last bit of uh, yarn that went through on the last round onto the hooks because you can see it looks a little bit like a holy stocking the start of that knitting because a couple of stitches are not on properly on the needles yet. And by using this very thin waist yarn it becomes very easy to see when there's a ladder like the one that you see there and all I have to do is grab one of the top stitches and pulling it over the needle. This is all waste yarn so it doesn't have to look decent yet, it doesn't have to look good yet. I just have to make sure that I get knitting and a stitch on every hook going around the outside. Once I've got that established I'm going to uh, keep knitting and knit a longer piece of uh, waste yarn like I'm doing now and I just keep checking making sure that I've actually got all the uh, needles with yarn on it now. So I can keep going for a bit now and uh, make sure that I've got enough uh, knitting so that it doesn't end up running. Uh, what I'm attaching at the moment there is a weight that hangs down from uh, the claw that the uh, stitches are still on at the bottom there and that weight replaces the pulling that I did with my left hand right at the beginning when there's no real uh, need yet for the weights and it's actually easier to just pull that Pull that knitting down with your hand because then you can really regulate the amount of tension you put on the thread which is useful right at the start. So uh, with the right amount of weights on 
I now have a nice tube of waste yarn, uh, which none of which is going to stay. That's all going to be taken off once I finish the socks. And I'm now replacing the waste yarn with the sock yarn that I'm going to knit with. The uh, sock knitter that I have has got 84 needles, which of course is quite a lot because 84 needles equals 84 stitches. So rather than using regular sock yarn, I'm using my Soliloquy sock lace, which has 600 meters per 100 grams rather than 400, and therefore is much better su suited for the kind of gauge that's, that this uh, sock knitter churns out. The yarn, as you can see, is like uh, variegated uh, white, gray, and black. And you'll see that coming through now in the tube in the middle. I've sped up the video here and there just to uh, keep things going and make it less boring to watch. But that's how um, you progress, really. In reality, all of this took me about 30 minutes to complete. Um, and it's a, I think it's an 11-minute video with bits taken out and sped up to make it a bit more watchable. There I am um, moving the weights on the tube at the bottom. I take the claw away and I put the weights on and I put them higher so that they don't end up dropping on the floor as the tube becomes longer. There I noticed that uh, one of the stitches had only been half caught by uh, a needle and uh, it would show just like it would in your hand knitting. It looks like a, a stitch is double the length because it has not uh, come off the, the needle properly as the next stitch was made. So I'm going one stitch down there, making sure by catching the stitch that it doesn't ladder all the way down my tube. And then I knit those stitches back up one at a time, just like you would do with a crochet hook in your hand knitting. Doing it very carefully and very gingerly because there is tension on that knitting and if I drop that stitch then it will run down much faster than it would do on your hand knitting. I'm using two little hooks that are very similar to the hooks or the knitting needles that are on the sock knitting machine. I will uh, put in a picture of a close-up of one of those needles because it's called a latching needle. It has a latch that can open and close in order to grab a stitch and allow the next, the thread from the next round to pull over it without being caught on the hook. That's how sock knitting machines work. Um, the latch really replaces the hand motion that you make when you pull a stitch through. So it's an arduous job as you see very carefully taking those stitches back up in order to catch that half made stitch. It just ends up being virtually impossible if you don't do that straight away to do it right at the end because your tube may end up being twice that length and if you right in the middle of the tube have one of these half stitches then trying to drop a stitch all the way down is a, a bigger job than it is doing it on the spot as soon as you, you, you notice it. You can see that I'm nearly there making that hooking motion for every next stitch for every next round until I'm all the way back again and putting the stitch back on the needle. You can also see that I'm almost, um, I almost caught a little knot there. I had a knot in my yarn, which is quite unusual, um, but it gave me a good opportunity to show you how to handle that. As you can see, I pulled the knot through in between two knitting needles to make sure that I don't end up with a knitting needle kind of 
getting caught on that knot and by pulling a little bit of extra thread through I now end up with two ends that once my tube is finished I can uh, cut the knot and then weave in and have a better um, a better finish than the little hole that you can see there. You can also see that I'm right at the end of my yarn and the easiest way to keep that going is to either attach the next yarn for the next tube that you want to knit or as I'm doing now just go back to the waste yarn and uh, put another number of rounds of waste yarn in before then attaching the next color. I will demonstrate how I do the little patches of double knitting that form the basis of the uh, gingham wingham, wingham, the center of it. As you can see, the um, surrounding area of the little patches is all knitted in garter stitch using both colors of yarn held together and then the little patches are made to look like gingham by knitting them in one color in the front while you're knitting the other color in the back. That's double knitting. Uh, throughout the uh, project you end up increasing both edges so every other row is an increase row and what you can see here is that I have increased one stitch by picking up the loop between the stitches on this last row. So the row that I'm going to knit now is not an increase row. The next one is again. It really helps to teach yourself to read your knitting in that way so you don't have to be too uh, religious about following every each and every line on a written knitting pattern. In this particular pattern you start every row with two stitches uh, that are knitted so you end up with garter stitch here and then the rest I said it was garter stitch I was mistaken it's not garter stitch it's moss stitch so um, in between the patches that is. So the patches ha are four stitches wide six row lo rows long and I've just finished one patch so this is a changeover row um, and I will show you how those are done. Um, in the um, process of increasing um, in subsequent areas there is more space for patches of course when uh, these patches were started there weren't another four stitches here but now there are before the edge so I can actually add a patch here having done the white the light patch uh, I'll call it white the white patch and then a row of dark patches now we're going to add a row of white patches again so um, I'll make a start and I'll keep track of where my four stitch segment starts to the right of the um, a previous patch. Uh, oh, the other thing to note is that on the needle like that all stitches look the same but um, these are stitches that were actually knitted together uh, with both colors. These were stitches that were knitted in two halves so they look like teams of stitches but they're actually separate ones and because we have uh, finished this little section here, this little separate section, above it is now going to be a tiny patch of um, the combination color whereas the stitches to the right of the black patch are now going to be split. So we're starting with two knit stitches then by reading the following stitch which was a knit that now needs to become a purl because we're doing moss stitch here. So I proceed with one knit and one purl. I check. Oh, I've gone too far. Look, there are only two stitches left before 
my next section. So I tink these back and these are on this side of the knitting going to become a white patch. I do that by bringing the white yarn to the front. Then I team tease out the white part of this combination stitch. Doesn't really matter how you do that. And I start knitting that as if to purl with my white yarn only. I purl it. I don't let it come off the needle. Then I bring my, my um, needle back into the black stitch as if to knit and I knit it. I bring it back and I let them both slide off together. So I purl the white part of the stitch, keep it on the needle and in the same sliding motion in this case I can go in as a knit stitch with the black part, knit that, let them both slide off. I'll repeat that again. It doesn't really matter which direction or which sequence the two parts of the stitch are in. I'll show you because these two are clearly the other way around. So I purl the white part of the stitch, then I knit the black part of the stitch, let them come off, and then the last one, purl the white part, going straight into knit the black part. Make sure that when you come back, you don't pick up the white one by mistake and let them slide off. So that was the first four. Now we've come to the end of that black, black section and that now becomes a combination. So I bring both yarns to the back. Whenever you start one of those combinations, always start with a knit stitch. And in this case, grab both stitches, knit them together as a knit. Both yarns to the front, and both stitches, both the black and the white section, become one stitch. Yarn to the back, knit the next two together, yarn to the front, purl the next two together. Oops, they slipped off. Here we are. So We've now made one section that is going to become white on this side of the knitting and one section that is going to be marled, a marlisle section above the black. Now our next section of white, bring the white yarn to the front, purl it, purl the white part of the stitch, knit the black one part of the stitch, Slide them off together, purl the white part, knit the black part, slip them off together. Throughout all this, I keep holding my yarns in exactly the same way, because although you're only knitting one half of the stitch at a time, because it's immediately followed by working the second half of the stitch, in terms of tension, you can just keep the yarns twisted around your pinky finger like like that so there's no tension issues so I again purl the neck the white part don't forget to knit the black part slide them off together we're on to the last stitch here purl the white part immediately knit the black part slide them off now we're all at our next little section that has been double knitted and that is now going to be marled. So both yarns to the back, pick up both stitch first stitches, two stitches together and knit them. Next two are going to be purled, a black and a white. Next black and a white are going to be knitted and the last black and white together are going to be purled.
Where's my black stitch? There it is. Both of them purled. White yarn to the front, black yarn in the back, purl the white, knit the black. Purl the white, knit the black. By doing it this way, you get used to the fact that your first stitch of one of these split segments is always a purl stitch. You'll see that when we turn around and come the other way. The first one is always a purl stitch. Purl the white, knit the black. And our two edge stitches. We clearly were one stitch short here, did you see that? I did five split stitches instead of four. That's why I'm one stitch short. I was trying to count while I was talking. Clearly can't do that. Maybe I used to and I can't do it anymore. I'm picking up both of them together because I only split them in this last stitch. So I want them back together. Let them come off together. So just to double check that's the last stitch of the Marlisle, and then we have in effect eight of these separate stitches. One white, one black, two white, two black, three white, three black, four white, four black. This was a purl on the previous row, so now it is a knit and two knit stitches to finish with. I will do another row. This last row was not an increase row, so this one is. I start with my two knit stitches. And because this is moss stitch and bumpy, etc., I don't bother with doing any twisting of stitches to hide my increases. I literally pick up the loop in between the two stitches and knit or purl it. But first, how to assess whether you're knitting or purling it. This is a purl, so that's going to be knitted now. So the one next to it needs to be purled. So I pick it up, bring my yarns to the front and purl it. I don't do any twisting, I just purl it. So it becomes a mini hole. I don't try to disguise that. You can see all the mini holes going down, but that doesn't matter. It makes for a nice crisp edge with these two garter stitch uh, stitches at the edge of the scarf. So that's a purl stitch. This becomes it. This is a knit stitch. And here I arrive at my split stitches. When in doubt, have a close up look. And you can see that this is a single stitch that has only been purled in black. There is no white on the little collar. These are split stitches. When in doubt, double check here. That was your combination square, which finished here. So here are your eight split stitches. Like I said before, the first stitch is always a purl. And in this case, of course, it's black. So bring your stitches to the front. off that yarn so it doesn't confuse things. Purl the black. Knit the white. Do you see that I'm now working them separately? Because they're not combined, combined stitches anymore, I don't then immediately go in to uh, knit the white because that would entangle them and we've just distangled them or detangled them. So that movement of um, purling a stitch and then knitting a stitch without dropping the purling stitch off the needle, you only do that when you're in your first row of separating the marled stitches into double knitting stitches. 
So I'm purling a black, I'm knitting a white, I'm purling a black, I'm knitting a white, purling a black. I normally hold my needles and my yarn very close to the tips. I'm trying to hold them a little bit further back so you can see better what I'm doing, which is why the whole thing is looking a little bit clumsy. So this is a knit stitch, the first of the four combined stitches, which I now need to purl. So I bring both yarns forward and I purl. As you can see, what I tend to do is keep my two yarns separate, one like this and one like that, and by pinching them together, I bring them together to work them together. So I bring them to the back, knit them together. Bring them to the front. This is just my preference, but of course you can do that differently. You can just bring them back together as you normally would, like that, and knit them. And then you can split them up again when you get to your next section. Remember to bring the black one to the front. That's your first stitch, which you are purling. Purl the black, knit the white, Pull the black, knit the white, pull the black, knit the white. Have I done all four? No, there's one left. This black stitch does not have a white collar. They're separate stitches. Last one, or last set of two. Pull the black, knit the white. And now we're back at our four next Marlisle stitches, which looks problematic. Do you see that? What's happened here is I had coming this way a knit, a purl, a knit, a purl. But I've got three stitches here. Half of that purl stitch did come, not come off the needle properly. So I need to bring that over so that that stitch has got both a black and a white collar on. Read your knitting, look what you're doing. If you see something that doesn't look right, work out by looking what's happening on either side, what has gone wrong. Bring both stitch, both yarns to the front, curl the first stitch, knit the next one, Curl the third, knit the fourth, and there's our last little set of double knitting stitches. Bring the black to the front, curl it, knit the white, number one, I'll count them this time, keep track of what I'm doing. Black two, white two. Black three, white three. Black four, white four. This one needs to be purled. Yarns to the front. Purl. Yarns to the back knit. Ah, let's not forget, I need to make a stitch. I'm knitting it. And then my last two knit stitches as part of my garter edge. So now we can see that next section emerge. If you're um, knitting curls like that, don't worry about it. That will all come out in the blocking. It will all settle and stretch and uh, flatten so you're not doing anything too tight. This automatically happens at the edge and it can all be blocked out. What you can see now after those first two rows is how the next little sections of the gingham are starting to appear with Marlisle above my black boxes and 
white patches above the Marlal boxes underneath. So by reading your knitting, you can always see what comes next. You have one little block of whites, then a block of blacks across, then a block of whites across, etc. And you just keep doing that and the increases stay the same for a while as well. So I've done the first two rows here. There would be four more rows exactly like it to follow with the every other row an increased stitch and doing your marlisle and double knitting patches and then you would swap again. To remind yourself how to swap just go back to the start of this video if you want to re-watch how to combine and how to separate these stitches. So here we are with a close-up of the two cardigans. Uh, this of course is the measurement I would like to copy and you can see from the one that's underneath that the newer one is slightly wider. There's not a massive amount in it but it is a bit wider and that's just enough together with its drapiness to almost pull it off my shoulders. So I'm going to narrow this. I start by taking a measurement of the width of the back neckline of my first cardigan. And what I want is to start in the, co in the corner between the shoulder seam and the neckline and run to the opposite corner between the shoulder seam and the neckline on the other side. I align it on one side with that corner point that I was referring to and I run it to the other end, the opposite side, same point. Following the curve a little bit, I don't want to stretch it or anything, just go from one corner to the other. I arrive at the other corner and it's exactly 30 centimeters, or if I would have worked in inches, I would have ended up with 11 and three quarters of an inch. So that's the width that I want that second cardigan to be. When I measure measure that from the same two between the same two points, I align in corner number one, run this to the opposite corner, and I end up with a width of 33 centimeters. Those so I want to go to 30 centimeters. That's the right kind of width for me. The way I do that is to take some ribbon that doesn't stretch. So you don't want to use bias ribbon. You want to use regular straight ribbon that doesn't have any stretch to it. And you're going to need a piece that is 30 centimeters long. I cut this ever so slightly longer so that I have a little bit of space to fold it in at the ends. Folding it in makes sure that I end, with, end up with a nice smooth end and no chance of it coming apart. So I fold it in a little bit. And can you see the seam and the bigger stitches? That Those are the edge stitches that have been picked up in order to knit that neckband. So I'm going to put it half on the inside and half on the outside of that. I attach the first corner, like I said, to the point where I want to start. I put a pin through to keep it in place, like that. Then I measure my 30 centimeters, and at the end of the 30 centimeters, I make my second fold. There we are. Fold here. That end is a little bit longer, I don't need it that long, so I cut it a little bit shorter. Fold it in like this and then I put a pin on the other corner at that same spot where my shoulder seam comes together with that neckline. There. You can see 
that one is short, shorter than the other. Now I find the midpoint of my little ribbon, which is going to be at 15 centimeters. I mark it with a pin and I find the midpoint of the neckline, which is very easy because in this particular cardigan, there are uh, increases at gradual intervals. So all I have to do is go to the midpoint in between the two little rows of increases here, and then I'll have the midpoint of my neckline. There. It doesn't come down to the last millimeter. I line up those two points and put the pin all the way through. That has ensured that the neckline that I'm making tighter is evenly divided between the two halves of the uh, band that I'm applying. I don't really have to, because I'm, I'm working in so little of extra width, I don't really have to do um, measurements for the midpoint between these two. I just put it down, make sure it looks nice and even and flat, and put another pin between those two points. I do the same again at the other side. So I have then divided my new tighter neckband into four evenly spaced sections. That ensures that I don't have any bunching up of fabric at any point. There we go. So there's my pins. There's my new little neckband. The most important part to anchor the ribbon on your neckline are these end points. Those are the ones that have to be the most secure to ensure that it doesn't go any wider. Any other stitches that you apply along the length of the ribbon are just to kind of keep it in place, but they will never be stressed. There won't be any tension on them. It's those two that get the tension because that's where the cardigan pulls, nowhere else. Grabbing one of my needles, this is from a needle set by Sajou, a French brand. I have their darning uh, yarns as well, and I have some of their needle sets. They're lovely needles, and they last for a very long time. So I cut off a piece, thread my needle, and start sewing. To hide the knot that I've just made in that thread, I hide it by putting it underneath my ribbon so it ends up in between the ribbon and the knitting that's all keep it hidden so placing the ribbon back into that corner spot I have to anchor this with a good couple of stitches and I literally just go through my knitting uh, I've ensured that I have a color of thread that is close to the yarn color so it won't be noticeable on the outside and because this is a little corner point anyway you won't see even if bits of thread are visible you won't really notice them on the outside of your knitting. So I make sure that I catch the wool properly in small doses, you only need one or two threads of the wool at a time. And now this is anchored properly. Now I'm just going to do very simple running stitches from this point to my first pin. Here I am at my first pin, which we'll, we can now pull out because the ribbon is in place. Keep going. 
So using that same running stitch, you work all the way to the other end of the ribbon and then repeat the entire exercise so you anchor the end and then do the running stitch along the bottom end of the ribbon. And that is it. For those of you who are wondering whether this kind of stitching can be done on the sewing machine, the answer is yes, but because the stitches on the sewing machine are flat and even and continuous, you are more likely to see the stitches of the sewing machine on the outside. Whereas in this way, with this method, because your stitches are not continuous, they don't show as much. Ta-da! Neckline all finished and a cardigan that won't slip off my shoulders anymore. I thought I would show it on as well. You can see that the neckline is now fine in the back and it hangs exactly the way I would like to and very similar to the other one. I've recorded a voiceover for the dress obsession this time. What you see is a mannequin that's eight inches shorter than I am, but the same size, a size 16. We're both wearing play suits, the mannequin in the petite length, and I'm wearing the size one play suit in the long length. And we're both wearing a cardigan that is exactly the same size. I'm trying to show that it hits us both in the same spots and uh, in both cases they're very wearable finishing just above the pocket and despite our height difference both of the outfits look great on both of us so here's the starting point of all of the outfits that i'm showing on this episode it's a, a wool play suit in a size one the long length but i could have worn a linen one as well the first layer that i'm adding is a big triangular shawl. It's one of my own patterns called Summer Storm. And um, if it gets a little bit nippy, the first thing that you could do is just to wear it loose over your shoulders. If you find that it slides off you or you want a little bit more coziness, then tie it up like I have done there. If uh, that doesn't give you enough warmth, then you can make it even warmer by pulling a little bit closer around your neck and tying it a little bit tighter. Then you end up with a little bit less coverage, of course, on your arms, but it's warmer around your neck and shoulders. The next step would be to um, wear it around your neck twice, as I have done here, which allows you to bunch it up around your neck even further. And it can also be effectively worn underneath garments that way. If you find that you lose a little bit too much of the lace effect, then you can just spread it out a little bit and pull it over your shoulders so that those pretty lace stitches at the bottom can be seen more easily. The effect though, in terms of warmth, is exactly the same and it gives you a nice cozy warmth around your shoulders and neck. If that's not enough, then the next thing that of course you can add is a cardigan. I first show the shawl tucked in, but again, if you want to see the edges of the shawl and you want to show off the lace, then you can pull it back out and show it over the top of the cardigan. But it's a nice way of adding an extra layer and still showing off your knits to full effect. Next up is um, a smaller cardigan. Um, in this case, it's the three season cardigan that I knitted a number of years ago. As you can see, it's quite fitted on me and it actually gives a nice impression of how you could use a cardigan that might be a bit fitted on you. And by buttoning it just at the top, it ends up looking really nice and you can get a lot of wear out of it. Whereas if this was a cardigan that had to be buttoned up all the way, it might look a little bit too snug on me. Wearing it like this, though, works extremely well and makes for a nice long silhouette. Stepping it up again, when the weather gets colder, would be to wear a bigger jumper over the top of a play suit or any other layer cake outfit. In this case, I've grabbed one of the samples at the studio, which is the Enchanted Mesa, a pattern by Stephen West. In this case, knitted in Soliloquy and Trinity Twist, my own yarns. I'm trying to wear it so that 
I still have full access to the pockets. That's why you see me fiddling so much with it. But I realized that actually if I pull it down a little bit further like that, then it actually looks better because it is a slightly longer line jumper the way I've knitted it. Um, adjusting the uh, collar there a little bit and the the shape of the collar is actually extremely suitable for uh, wearing in combination with a scarf or a shawl. I'm showing that there again using the uh, summer storm with the little the pretty little frills hanging out and showing but um, instead of having them hanging on the outside you can also tuck them in and um, I'm going to show that with this next one with the, the Trinity Shrug, which I'm first showing with um, all the loose bits hanging out and then tucking it in, winding it around my neck further and using that nice big collar that is on the jumper to hold the uh, scarf in place around my neck, keeping me nice and warm. Of course, a differently shaped jumper, either um, more boxy or a long line would give a different silhouette and uh, that's what I'm going to show next with this long line cardigan that I'm wearing. It's a pattern called Firth of Forth by Kate Davies. It's knitted here in soliloquy and uh, the reason I'm showing it is to show that a very long line cardigan, one that is almost down to my knees on me, looks really well in combination with a play suit and again it's a nice extra layer keeping your uh, back nice and warm. Meanwhile I've been uh, fiddling with a nice scarf around my neck called the Six Frills um, which is a nice extra layer as well but not worn too closely around the neck and therefore uh, not too warm if you find that work uncomfortable. Uh, this outfit is uh, to add another layer where it could actually be worn on top of uh, a jumper or other garments that you're already wearing. Because I'm in the studio, I haven't done that. It's uh, a poncho by uh, Aubas Knitwear. Um, I still have some in stock and they are great merino ponchos that are priced very nicely and work beautifully in this kind of in-between weather where it's not cold enough to wear a full-blown coat, but you do want an extra layer. And of course, these can be worn both inside and outside in combination with other knits or by themselves. Um, showing here how the poncho looks on a, a shorter frame, again, dressed up with um, an extra scarf, or, or uh, in this case, the Trinity Shrug used as a scarf around the neck. The uh, poncho, as you can see, is slightly asymmetric. I really love that about them. You literally just throw them on and wear them however they fall. And they are very comfy, warm and easy to wear. Um, then showing here the long line cardigan on the shorter frame. And uh, for people who think, well, those long line dresses and long line cardigans look great, but not when you're short not true at all. Um, as you can see, it looks just as effective on a shorter person. It's kind of a duster, almost a duster type style. And uh, I think it looks fantastic. Uh, whether you're taller or shorter doesn't make a difference, really. Both look equally effective. I hope that's given you some inspiration. See you next month.